27 octobre 2001, Steve Jobs présente l'iPod. 20 ans plus tard et plus de 400 millions d'exemplaires vendus. Retour sur le succès phénoménal du baladeur iconique des années 2000 avec un évité exceptionnel. Tony Faddle, celui qui est considéré comme le père de l'iPod, revient sur sa genèse. Comment a-t-il été conçu dans le plus grand secret Comment a-t-il changé profondément Apple et va permettre l'arrivée de l'iPhone Témoignage exclusif Bonjour à toutes et à tous, vous regardez On refait le Mac alias ORLM, très heureux de vous retrouver pour notre débat tech hebdomadaire. Bienvenue dans notre nouveau studio ici au cœur de Paris, rue, le, rue La Boissy, au village by Sia qui nous accueille. Euh, je vous le disais en préambule, nous recevons un invité rare dans les médias, Tony Fadel. Bonjour Tony. Hi, hi Olivier. C'est un vrai plaisir de vous recevoir. Qui de mieux que vous, hein, Tony, pour, pour nous parler de l'iPod, pour cette émission spéciale, euh, car vous êtes l'un des papas euh, du baladeur d'Apple. Merci d'avoir accepté une, votre invitation. Alors, vous avez un, un CV à, à rallonge. Hein. Vous avez été de 2001 à 2008, Tony, le vice-président d'Apple en charge de la division iPod. Vous m'arrêtez si je dis des bêtises. Vous avez supervisé tout le développement du matériel, des logiciels et des accessoires. Euh, C'est bien cela, Tony J'ai rien oublié. Euh, et puis, par la suite, vous avez rejoint... Euh, votre propre, vous avez créé votre propre société, Nest, euh, vous avez rejoint Google, mais c'est une autre histoire. Euh, en tout cas, vous êtes certainement la personne la mieux placée pour nous parler euh, du petit baladeur d'Apple. Alors, pas de chroniqueurs cette semaine en plateau exceptionnellement. Euh, ils vont intervenir en vous posant des questions, vous allez voir Tony, qu'on a enregistré en vidéo directement, euh, et vous vous serez amené à y répondre. Euh, alors, Tony, on fait un retour en arrière, 20 ans déjà en arrière, et on va s'intéresser à la genèse de l'iPod au sein d'Apple. Genèse Express, c'est ce qui définit le mieux, je dirais, l'iPod. Comment est né le projet P68 Dulcimer, si je dis bien, si je prononce bien, au sein d'Apple C'est le nom de code de l'iPod, Tony. Yeah, the code name of iPod was uh, P68 or Dulcimer. And uh, Dulcimer was actually named by uh, Stan Eng, who was the product manager uh, working with me at the time from the marketing department. And uh, he came up with the, the name Dulcimer. P68 was something that's just an engineering code name. But Dulcimer because it's a sweet sounding instrument. And so Stan had that and I was like, I heard it, I was like, oh, that's a great name. So we, we just stuck with that code name and, uh, and moved forward very quickly. <laughs> Alors regardez, on a une question pour vous, Tony, une question de notre chroniqueur, il s'agit de Stéphane Zibi. Bonjour Tony, merci encore de venir nous voir dans Refait le Mac, c'est toujours un plaisir de vous avoir. Et une question toute simple, c'est comment vous avez été recruté par Apple et est-ce que par, plus particulièrement vous avez été recruté par la firme de Cupertino spécialement pour développer l'iPod Merci en tout cas encore, à très bientôt. Great, Tony. thanks. Well actually, I, 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 I guess I was sort of recruited. Um, what happened was very simply, I had, uh, I, I was working at a company called General Magic years before, and I worked with someone, his name's Ali Alasti, and Ali and I were friends, and we stayed friends, um, and he had friends at Apple, who he had worked with in the past, and so I was just simply, uh, having lunch with Ali and uh, telling him about my startup and how we were trying to make... Um, these devices and that there was no funding available at all and things were really looking difficult. And so Ali goes, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that or whatever. The next day he has a lunch with a person from Apple. And, and this person from Apple goes, hey, do you want to, you know, do, uh, do you know somebody who knows, you know, small handheld devices, maybe looking for something, something to do? And Ali goes, interestingly enough, I had lunch with him yesterday. You guys should talk. And so After a series of a couple of weeks, then I, we just started talking. I got a call um, while I was on a ski slope in, in Vail, Colorado, and uh, uh, my uncle was sitting next to me, and I was like, Apple's calling, why is this? And, and so literally one thing led to another, and I thought that we, I might be able to save my struggling startup at the time, and it turned out that uh, they wanted me to consult to, uh, to design what would become the iPod. Then it was a digital music player. I thought it was going to be some kind of handheld computing device because that's what I was known for at the time. But no, it was for music, which was something I was working on at Few Systems, my startup, just, uh, just before coming to consult it at Apple. 
Fiosisem, c'était la start-up que, que, que vous aviez créée à l'époque, c'est ça, euh, Tony euh, Au-delà, donc, il n'y avait pas forcément aujourd'hui, comme il existe dans la Silicon Valley ou dans la tech, euh, une armée de chasseurs de tête qui, euh, qui partaient à l'assaut euh, des, des talents de, pour, pour, pour concevoir l'iPod. Et, euh, et vous avez... Euh, il y a une date qui, qui évoque certainement quelque chose pour vous, c'est le 3 janvier 2001. Ah, uh, yes, uh, that was. For me, it was kind of the beginning of the end of our, of our, our few systems. It was kind of, okay, it's a new year, it's now starting time to think about what's next, because I don't know if the startup was going to go well. And, uh, I had also gone to, uh, Il a fallu faire quelque part le deuil de votre start-up pour aller euh, vers, euh, vers euh, Apple, bah, surtout que ce n'était pas un emploi encore, vous étiez juste entre guillemets un consultant euh, et, et, et que vous aviez auparavant essayé déjà de, de développer ce concept de l'iPod sur vos propres marques avec Fuse System, mais également sur d'autres marques plus prestigieuses comme Philips. Pourquoi euh, le, 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 je dirais le, le, le baladeur tel que vous l'imaginiez n'arrivait pas à sortir en dehors que finalement que chez iPod? Well, I think, you know, if you have, you have to look at the time, it was right after, in 2001, that early part of 2001, the internet crashed, the internet market crashed in April 2000. And there was no money for anyone, any startups at that time. There was, it was a crazy boom and then a huge, huge bust. And so no one was getting any money in Silicon Valley. The internet was not living up to the hype. And so a hardware company, doing consumer electronics was the last thing anyone wanted to fund at the time. So in January, I had to take a severe action to figure out what we were going to do with the team at, at, at Few Systems, what we were going to do next. And um, I, you know, when I got the call from Apple, it was really, it was like, okay, maybe I'll consult for some money, get some money and keep the team together and move on through that. Or possibly Apple will buy the team or what have you. And so, so it was, uh, it was quite a, interesting time of what could the future look like because i don't know if it was going to be the startup but i didn't know it was going to be apple either because apple is not the apple we know it today 20 years ago apple was a very very different company it was struggling um at steve had just come back uh they were they were underwater and dead in about 250 million dollars they had 500 million dollars in the bank um And they were lucky to be break even each quarter on the sales. It was less than 2% market share in the US for Max in the US. In the worldwide, it was even lower than that. And so Apple was a very, very different place than we, we, we know it today. C'est presque un risque que vous preniez en signant pour Apple? Oh, absolutely. It was a huge risk to take to, to go to Apple. For, oh, consulting was okay, but then to actually join, I had a, a long period of time where I was thinking about, do I really want to join Apple given all the, situa the situation, the markets and everything else. On vous, a, on vous a proposé très rapidement d'intégrer Apple et devenir un salarié d'Apple. Yeah, so what happened specifically was I, we had, um, I had designs and things of that nature from Fuse, but they were for a, a different product, but the same kind of guts, the same electronics. When I came as a consultant, I was asked, hey, there's iTunes. I, we're trying, and iTunes was only six, seven months old at the time. We're trying to hook it up to all these digital music players. iPod wasn't the first MP3 player. And so we're trying to hook these up to iTunes and we can't make them work. We think there'd be an, what would an Apple product look like if we were to take over that part of the market? And so that was my, my challenge. And then within a span of six weeks, I put together all the pieces from what I knew from Fuse, from all the new research I did over that time, and put together a, 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 a styrofoam, weighted styrofoam model, put together all kinds of different uh, bombs and cogs and architectures and designs and everything, and then presented them to Steve at the end of March in 2001. And, and that's when, uh, that's when uh, the, it, the project was greenlighted. Donc six semaines seulement pour développer un produit, c'est vraiment, enfin, du moins pour le prototype, c'est euh, à une vitesse phénoménale. Donc vous avez bénéficié, j'imagine, des acquis de Fio System et de, de, de Philips It was, it wasn't a working prototype. It wasn't a working prototype. It was all the different pieces, understanding all the pieces, understanding the costs, understanding how they could fit together, how they would work together, just putting, putting everything so that you know, okay, I have this palette of things and I think we can build these things. Now, did I know we could build those things? Did I know it would work 100%? Absolutely not. That happened in the months after that. 
Euh, un petit souvenir du pitch euh, du produit à, avec Steve Jobs Qu'est-ce qui, une anecdote peut-être <laughs> Well, of course, I was terribly nervous. Um, very, very nervous because from my time at General Magic, I had learned of all kinds of stories from, of Steve, and I had met him a couple of times, very, very informally. But I heard all kinds of crazy stories about Steve. And so when I got in, I was very nervous. But, but very quickly, within five minutes, we were just talking on the level about the product and all these different things. And, and it was very comfortable and very natural. And um, there was one point in the meeting, like at the beginning of the meeting, we had all these slides prepared. I hand him over this deck of slides, because we, there was no PowerPoint, nor excuse me, keynote and projectors and all that stuff. It was literally printed pages. Hand him over to Steve, and Steve looks at his basically throws them aside and said, okay, <laughs> you know, and, and so I, I was prepped for that. Stan did a great job prepping me for that, but, but it was really just a very down-to-earth meeting, just talking about all kinds of ideas and what could happen, and, and at some point they were like, uh, you know, should we let him inside? Because I was still a consultant, right? I was not on the inside of Apple, and then during that meeting, then I got more of the you know, the details behind the scenes of what they wanted to do. And, of course, of the idea that, that um, they were toying with, which was the click wheel. So, the, well, it was the scroll wheel first. It became the click wheel later. But the scroll wheel was something that they were like, oh, this is a great product. We love everything. But would you, could you put one of these on it? And I was like, and I played, and I was like, oh, that's a scroll wheel. Okay, yeah, that's easy. And, and from there, it was all put together, literally in that meeting, And we ran, ran, ran until you no know, end of October. Très rapidement. Yeah, yeah. Très rapidement. Très, très, très rapidement. Euh, vous avez développé le produit en seulement le prototype en seulement six semaines, mais en, en quelques mois seulement. Le 17 octobre 2001, le produit était déjà présenté par Steve euh, lors d'une keynote, et puis euh, disponible quelques semaines plus tard en novembre. Euh, quelques mois, neuf mois pour euh, sortir un produit. Yeah. Euh, C'est incroyable également le temps de, very, very de gestation jusqu'à. Euh, jusqu'au moment où il sort en, yeah, yeah. en magasin. On a trouvé des notes que, que sur un blog que vous aviez publié il y a quelques mois. Regardez ces, ces notes qu'on va vous diffuser. Allez, racontez-nous cette, cette période, parce que ça sent assez extraordinaire. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had learned from my time at other large companies like Philips that very quickly antibodies can set into a new project and that you have to prove yourself. And you have to earn your worth if you're a new thing that's going to take resources away from other, other projects. And so I knew we had to ship it by that Christmas. If we didn't, this whole thing could be not happening because who knows, Sony could do something, competitors could do something, and then Apple could kill the project. I saw that happen all the time at other companies I had worked with or worked for at the time. So I was very worried that if I come in, we have to ship something. So there was, a, there was a stress that I put on myself as, as well as the team to make sure we shipped. But during that time, we did a lot of things. So, you know, a lot of things aligned. The storage from Toshiba came out just at the very time, at the beginning of the project, the storage, the little hard drive, um, the five gigabyte hard drive. Then from there, the, the, the hardware platform, the digital hardware platform was available and just coming out of Uh, the foundry, the semiconductor foundry, for uh, something called the Portal Player 5001, which was the core chip for that. Then we also were able to um, work with the Pixo team, and they had the, 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 the user interface. Yeah, the user interface. So we were able to put all of those pieces together. I found all of them, put them all together, and then we marched very, very quickly, but we didn't have a team. We had no team. We had to put the team together. Vous êtes parti d'une feuille blanche et il y avait zéro équipe. Yeah, the whole team came together. Um, we brought people from Fuse. We brought um, I, I brought people that I knew from General Magic as well as a, a Philips and things. Et c'est un peu une exception au sein d'Apple qu'un produit comme ça en mode commando euh, sorte si, euh, ripa, si, ra, si rapidement avec finalement des composants, des éléments qui ne sont pas forcément à l'origine au sein d'Apple. C'est extrêmement rare cet exemple. Et au, et au delà, un produit qui a été aussi populaire dans l'industrie. Avoir une genèse aussi rapide, je crois que c'est assez unique également. It, it, it was very quick. We had obviously the, the, the oversight by Steve. You know, um, he, he would make sure that all the teams understood that if they were working with us in some form, that we were the highest priority, which was amazing. Um, but also, uh, you know, one thing that really did 
f happen quickly is people wanted to see this product come to life as quickly as possible. So we had a lot of energy in the team. Luckily, everything just kind of, it wasn't easy, but it all kind of fit together like Lego blocks pretty rapidly. Um, we had some, some, some issues, but we got over them, obviously. So it was all good. Et c'est quelque part un mode start-up en fait qui était en une culture start-up qui était en place. We were à we were 100% a start-up. In fact, we were such a start-up that a lot of the tools and techniques Apple had at the time for making laptops weren't good weren't good enough, advanced enough for what we needed for the small little resistors and capacitors and all of the things there, some of the testing systems, all of those things we had to create from scratch or we had to go get new software tools to be able to help us create a much smaller product than Apple had really ever created before. Yep. Et, et par la suite, les projets auxquels vous avez collaboré, et puis, et un, des, un, un majeur, c'est bien sûr l'arrivée la, de l'iPhone quelques années plus tard. Yes. Ça, la genèse a été beaucoup plus longue, là, c'était plus compliqué. Euh, c'est vraiment, encore une fois, inhabituel qu'en quelques mois seulement, on arrive à sortir un produit. Oui, je pense que la vision de l'iPod était très pure. C'était was juste la musique. Et puis, avec le temps, ça a ajouté des photos, des vidéos, et tous les autres médias, des jeux et des choses. Sur l'iPhone, c'était beaucoup plus ambitieux. And we had started with many different routes of how to put a, a phone into the portfolio, whether that was an iPod, iPod plus phone or whether it was the iPhone we knew then. And so we had to do a lot of explorations and we had multiple teams doing different things. Our team obviously made the iPhone and, uh, and the, all the low level software, all the foundational software all the touchscreens, all that stuff. So we brought that to life and then another team brought the whole operating system and apps on top of that. Et quelque part, vous avez fait le baladeur dont vous rêviez quelque part. Hein. Plus, il n'y avait pas d'études de marché, ça, c'est inhabituel. J'imagine que chez Philips, par exemple, c'était d'abord ce que l'étude des focus group qui, qui a prédominé. Là, c'était vraiment... Non, 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 non. We, we were able to focus exactly. We just want to play on the iPod. We just want to play music. How can we play music, digital music that came from iTunes? How do we make it really easy Um, and so just listen to music on the iPod. If you're going to do any music management, if you're going to do any kind of other complex functionality, do it on the computer. Don't bother with the iPod. The iPod is purely for m listening enjoyment and nothing more. Pure. Et un baladeur pur blanc est né qui va devenir vraiment l'un des objets iconiques du début des années 2000. Euh, quelle est la recette magique de l'iPod On en parle après ce jingle. Alors l'iPod, Tony, c'est avant tout un disque dur, vous en parliez un instant, dans la poche. C'est une particularité forte hein, de l'iPod. C'était un, un disque dur de 5 Go, apte à accueillir jusqu'à 1000 chansons dans la poche. C'était l'argument de vente à l'époque, à l'époque où, la, où la, finalement la concurrence se limitait à quelques morceaux hein, seulement. Oui, yeah, well, il y avait deux différents types dans les compétiteurs. Il y avait deux différents types. Il y avait les flash based players, quand Flash était très small, pas comme aujourd'hui. Et ils pouvaient fit maybe 12, 15, 20 songs on those little flash players. Or there was a hard drive player, but they were the big hard drives, the five and a quarter or three and a half inch hard drive, and they were very big and heavy. You could store thousands and thousands of songs on it. So you either had basically a CD's worth of music, if people remember what CD's were, and, and then the hard drive full. But there was nothing that was like, that could fit in your pocket. This was too big, this could fit in your pocket, but only store a CD. And it was really, both of them were very cumbersome. They didn't have user interfaces that were easy to access and find your songs or put songs on or have very long battery life. So what we did was design something that was in the middle ground, something that could fit in your pocket, held enough songs, not every song in your, where it was quick to charge, had long battery life so you could go all day, you know, and all week even. Um, And, and it was paired with the best software out there, which was iTunes for managing and, and putting your music, taking your music on and off of that. And so that was really what it was about. Um, obviously, it had an incredible interface um, to make it fun and emotional to find and, and play your music. Mais ce n'était pas pour autant, Tony, le premier, vous en parliez tout à l'heure, disque, enfin, baladeur du marché et baladeur équipé d'un disque dur. En France, en l'an 2000, une start-up, son nom, mm -hmm. Arcos, Arc. lance Jukebox, équipé d'un disque dur un uh -huh. an avant l'iPod. On a une question à ce sujet d'un de, de nos tweetos sur Twitter. Il s'agit de Lénaïque <rire> Petit-Pierre. Bonjour à Rofé Lemac et à Tony Fadel. Est-ce qu'Apple s'est inspiré d'Arcos pour créer l'iPod, Tony 
<laughs> no, iPod was not inspired by Arcos to create the iPod, no. Um, this was, I, I did have one. I had a whole range of all the competitor devices. But, you know, at the end of the day, Arcos was really kind of what I was describing. It was too big for your pocket. It was, it had lots of songs, but didn't have good battery life, and it had a horrible user interface. Sorry, Arcos, but it was true. And so, you know, there were other hard drive players at the time, but uh, I think we, we obviously created the, the best one for the, for the moment. Et au-delà, Tony, le, le disque dur de, de l'iPod, vous soulignez tout à l'heure la marque Toshiba, était vraiment révolutionnaire right. à l'époque. C'est vraiment ça qui a aussi fait la différence. It made a huge difference, but Toshiba didn't believe in it. So that's ah, the vraiment. funny thing. Toshiba, really? Toshiba, they made the card, and the whole reason, or excuse me, they made the hard drive the size of a PCM CIA card. People don't, probably don't remember this, but there's these big cards exactly. that you would insert into. They were about the size of a credit card, but about five millimeters to six millimeters thick. And you could insert them into laptops, and they would have modems or Ethernet or, or, or audio functionality or whatever. So what they did was they said, we're going to make a hard drive that fit in this little slot, this credit card-like slot. And so when... I came to them and I said, hey, we want to use this for a music player. They're like, okay, <laughs> but I don't think there's much of a market for that. Okay. We see other hard drive-based music players out there and MP3, the market's not really going anywhere. They're like, okay. And I said, then I said, well, if you don't really care that much about it, well, we would like to have an exclusive for this hard drive for the next few years. <laughs> And you can't sell it to any of anybody else doing a music or video player or anything like that. Only us doing portable music players. They said, no problem. Well, it, <laughs> it worked out pretty well <laughs> for both, both Toshiba and for us, obviously. Donc c'est un point important que vous souligniez là, Tony, parce que vous avez acheté du coup toute la production de disques durs à Toshiba et du coup vous, empêche, vous avez empêché toute la concurrence de copier l'iPod puisqu'il n'y avait pas d'autres disques durs sur le marché. There was no other 5 gigabyte small form factor uh, there, and Toshiba had to add extra, extra capacity to their hard drive line to make more for us. And remember that card that they wanted, that same hard drive they wanted to fit in all of the laptops? It never took off. It never took off as a hard drive for uh, replaceable. So it was pretty interesting how it, how it all changed for Toshiba and for us. Et c'est vraiment à, à cette période-là, donc vous citiez l'exemple de l'exclusivité qu'a pris euh, naissance cette, ce management si particulier de la logistique chez Apple, notamment euh, grâce à Tim Cook, qui va perdurer euh, avec les versions suivantes de l'iPod. Vous disiez vous aviez l'exclusivité du Toshiba. Après, vous avez l'exclusivité de la mémoire avec Samsung pour les, les générations suivantes de euh, d'iPod. Et puis est arrivé les écrans multipoints. Cette stratégie, elle est vraiment née avec l'iPod chez Apple de dire on va lancer un produit révolutionnaire et on va euh, assécher le marché en ayant l'exclusivité des composants. I, I don't know about fixing the market, but yes, absolutely, we were strategic to make sure that when we were going to invest in a brand and invest in creating a new market, because we were making a new market, we made sure that we were able to understand the right business principles we needed to to make these kinds of huge investments and make sure that we and our customers were able to get what they needed. Because we were out, we were for years out of, like I think it was two and a half, three years, we could never catch up to the demand of the iPod. And we needed all those vendors making for us, right? And making more for us. And that includes the Nano, uh, the, the Nano and the Mini and all of the other, the ones along the route. And so that was very interesting time. Touchscreen as well, as you, as, you, as, you, as you said, for the iPhone. So it was always a business strategy. You know, when, when we put the 30-pin connector on there, you know, I remember pinning out the 30-pin connector and putting it on. We made sure that we had the, uh, the authorized accessory program at that time. Now we know it is, it's come on the lightning connector and all that stuff, but it's the same exact program all the way to that. Even to HomeKit today is all part of that. Um, which started with the iPod. Et, et tout est parti d'une d'une idée d'une pas une obsession, je dirais une certitude au, dans votre esprit, Tony, c'était de dire que un baladeur il devait héberger un disque dur à l'époque. Oh, there was no other choice. There, oh, the only choice was a hard drive. For if you were going to have a thousand songs in your pocket, Flash was much too small. The only reason why Flash got to be large enough and why we were able to make finally the iPod Nano was It, you might not recall, but the lowest iPod Nano was still very tiny compared to the iPod 
classic or five gigabyte original iPod, because I think it was only two gigs or something like that, or four gigs when we originally shipped an iPod Nano. So that was always a trade-off there. But obviously the small size, the battery power, or, you know, better battery life, and also, you know, r rugged, uh, rugged uh, casings so that you could drop it that was also really important. But yeah, no, all the way along, we had to make all kinds of conscious decisions on storage and battery and display, all those things. Et c'est amusant de voir que l'inventeur de cette techno, euh, Toshiba, n'ait pas perçu le potentiel de sa techno. Et euh, on, a, on, a, on invente finalement un périphérique d'un ordinateur on, et on n'imagine pas les usages qui peuvent aller au-delà. C'est assez étonnant. L'autre point fort, Tony, de l'iPod euh, face à la concurrence, c'était sa grande simplicité, bien sûr, euh, mythique hein, du blader, sa simplicité d'usage. Quelle était la recette de cette euh, simplicité On va égrainer ensemble les ingrédients. Alors Tony, simple comme l'iPod bien sûr, euh, on le disait à l'instant, la simplicité d'usage était vraiment euh, le point fort de l'iPod. Il a fallu concevoir un, un système d'exploitation, on l'a un peu survolé tout à l'heure mais on y revient peut-être plus en détail, une interface graphique sur mesure pour l'iPod. C'est correct. Donc, so, um, you know, what really we did was we went and we licensed some software from a company called Pixo. Um, Pixel was started by a guy named Paul Mercer, and Paul Mercer had worked at Apple way, way back in the time I knew Paul from General Magic. So it was all this kind of club. So Paul came, we licensed the software, and then we had a bunch of their team who created the software help us cre quickly create the interface that we wanted and mock it up so that we could then go to, to go get, get it obviously out by that November time frame. So it was definitely a team effort, many different teams from Portal Player, from Pixo, from inside of Apple, from outside of Apple with our manufacturing to put this all together in record time because we didn't have all the resources at Apple at the time. Et, et, et l'un des alors cette interface a, a créé un petit peu le débat à l'époque parce que l'un des pionniers des baladeurs MP3 il s'agissait de, de Creative hein, va par la suite poursuivre Apple pour violation de brevets. On a une question à ce sujet de Damien Douani, notre chroniqueur. Bonjour Tony, bonjour à toutes et à tous. En 2006, Apple est obligé de payer 100 millions de dollars euh, suite à une action en justice à Creative pour pouvoir utiliser l'interface graphique de leur lecteur multimédia et MP3 Zen. Et pourtant c'est Apple qui va faire un hit mondial avec l'iPod et pas Creative. Et donc, pourtant, Creative avait eu l'idée à l'origine. Donc, la question, c'est comment il se fait que ils ont, vous avez réussi plutôt là où ils ont échoué. C'est quoi le tour de magie Ok. So, that's, so the, creative, the creative lawsuit. Um, well, first, it wasn't about the user interface. The cre uh, creative, um, uh, the creative uh, uh, patent was all about how you transferred, how you transferred data, uh, metadata about the songs, and so you could represent them in different ways. So they really went to that. So what we did, because I was part of all of the the lawsuit pieces, and Chip Lutton, who uh, was an uh, who is an amazing IP attorney and now major attorney. He and I worked together to figure out what we were going to do about creative. And so when it came to creative, Chip went through with all these outside counsels and they figured out the best thing to do was just settle for, we could go to court, but it could be long and drawn out and maybe they could win royalties or whatever else um, on the thing, on, on iPod sales, or we could just settle with them, put it into bed and get rid of it. And so obviously we settled. Um, because Steve did not want to go through a long, drawn-out battle in court. He just wanted to do And so we came up with a number, and then Steve goes, well, will that get the job done? And they go, yeah, we think that'll get the job done. And he said, okay, no, round it up to 100 million so we know it'll get the job done. I don't want to have to worry about this headache anymore. So, so instead of trying to win, it was just silencing someone completely silencing them and making sure we just executed pristinely every year. If you look, you know, my team and I, we were responsible 18 generations of the iPod. Every holiday season, there was another one or two or three iPods plus accessories that would come out every holiday season for seven years or so, six years. And so that unrelenting progress that we made just kept all the competition in the distance. Once you're in the lead, technology changes so quickly, you have to stay in the lead, you have to leapfrog yourself. And why the iPhone came out, right? As opposed to someone else doing it first. 
It's always about eating your own, always about doing better, and making sure that the competition are well in the rear view mirror, not ever getting ahead of you. And so that they, they literally, you know, uh, how can I put it this way? They get dejected and say, we'll never catch up. And they kind of give up. Mm. Oui, Psychology. Ça s'est reproduit également pour l'iPhone quelques années plus tard. Et quelque part, j'ai lu que cette mésaventure avec Creative a eu un impact très important sur euh, Steve Jobs et sa volonté qu'il a eu par la suite de tout euh, breveter. C'est vrai Steve, well, Steve actually got the idea for patenting everything was back in the early Windows days. <laughs> so he got that, that idea from Mac versus Windows and, exactly. and was really upset because he remembers showing the Mac operating system to Bill Gates. They did Word, they started, and then they started doing it in Windows and da da da. So anyways, so that was just something that we were doing all along and we were doing that on iPod. We were doing all kinds of patents and then Steve just went and ramped it up because he saw a new operating system, a whole new in the iPhone. And then he decided to go really, really uh, blazing on the IP side. Et autre poursuite judiciaire à l'époque, on va clôturer là, le, le, le chapitre des poursuites, je vous rassure Tony, euh, et on n'était pas courant, nous journalistes et observateurs de, de, du marché, euh, c'est celle des Beatles, enfin la maison 10 des Beatles qui s'appelait Apple, comme la maison mère euh, des, des Apple <rire> Computer, euh, puisqu'il y avait eu un, un gentleman agreement, ou je dirais une, une, une décision de justice qui disait qu'Apple, vous pouvez exploiter le nom Apple pour, euh, pour les ordinateurs, parce que vous êtes dans le domaine de l'informatique, mais vous ne devez pas toucher la musique. Voilà. Vous en aviez conscience de ça en travaillant chez Apple, que vous n'aviez pas oh, le droit yeah. de travailler sur la musique Very, very much so. But again, there's working on music and producing your own songs and artists and having a label and being competitive that way versus reproducing it. And so, again, this is one of those, as, as you say, gentlemen's agreements that happened a long time ago. It showed up. And then again, Steve was just like, okay, what? Because he, he adored the Beatles, right? He, that was one of his favorites along with you know Bob Dylan and what have you and so he he out of respect he was just like okay let's go clear this up once and for all okay so and also at the same time Apple changed its name from Apple computer to Apple and removed the computer side so all of this happened kind of in the 2005-06 time frame when when um when the company was really transitioning to a whole new way not away from the mac but addition things around the mac that was really bringing apple into how you know it today et, et euh, on me glisse une, 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 une question qui n'était pas prévue dans, dans l'oreillette justement quel était le, on parle de musique euh, et des beatles quel était le premier morceau de musique que vous avez écouté sur votre prototype d'ipod vous en souvenez On mine, um, yeah, it was it was uh, the Beck album. Was the original Odile Beck album um, was playing. Um, that was a, Alors, a, a, a special time. Au-delà du Black album des Beatles, euh, quelle était la, cette fois-ci la, la perception des majors du disque quand ils ont vu débarquer euh, l'iPod euh, On était très, ils étaient plutôt méfiants, j'imagine à l'époque. With the iPod. They weren't necessarily suspicious because it was a digital music player. When iTunes decided, well, when Steve decided that iTunes should have a digital music store, then Steve went around the world to convince the, the record labels and executives that, look, your music is being stolen already. It's being ripped. It's being moved around the Internet. You might as well give people what they want and start charging for them, charging for those songs and doing it in a, in a quality a convenient way and so Steve proposed iTunes being the digital music store for selling singles and that because the Mac had such a small user base such a tiny user base it's just a test don't worry we'll test it and if it works well you can go take it and you can do all that you want with Windows machines or whatever else and so that's how it started and then again it became such a big success that then You know, it went to movies and what have you after that. Et je me souviens qu'à l'époque, lorsqu'on on déballait un iPod, on ouvrait l'iPod et puis il y avait un petit cellophane collé sur l'écran. Il y avait marqué euh, dans Still You Music, ne volez pas la musique. Euh, donc c'est vraiment un, un, un mot très important. Exactement. Revenons un instant sur la, la simplicité propre à l'iPod. Donc on a parlé de l'interface euh, utilisateur, le disque dur qui permet de, de glisser euh, très facilement euh, tous ces morceaux. Il y a bien sûr la molette euh, qui est vraiment iconique également de l'iPod à l'époque, on l'a devant vous. Euh, une question à ce sujet de Christophe Aigrand. Euh, 
euh, Aigron sur Twitter. Pourquoi justement une molette Ça aussi, ça a été une évidence par rapport mm -hmm. à la concurrence. It is obvious when you start knowing you're going to scroll lists of things. When you're just scrolling lists and you're not inputting anything, you know, you know in terms of text or dial or, or uh, dialing a number or something, it's really nice. It's really fluid. It's fast. We spend a lot of time getting the acceleration right. So if you turn it so many times at a certain rate, it'll start to accelerate and, you, and the audio feedback. So it's a very visceral experience and it's an emotional experience and it's very different than the rest of, uh, of any of the products that are there. They're typically buttons, press and hold, press and hold, what have you. This was, gave it a new feel, a new look. People didn't even know what it was. The most people thought it was a speaker on the front of it, as opposed to a, a scroll wheel. But once they got it, they got it really fast and they go, oh yeah. And so it was just, it was a great rational reason and emotional reason for selecting the quick wheel. And it was great, but it was also the thing that undermined us when it came time for the iPhone because we wanted to do an iPod plus phone, but because, and maybe that was the best thing, maybe the, having a, a, a scroll wheel slash click wheel there made us go to the iPhone. And so we made the iPhone because of that, of that early decision in the click wheel. La, la décision de, de switcher sur le, le téléphone, elle a été très rapide, dès, euh, dès le début, de, dès votre, presque dès votre, votre arrivée euh, au sein d'Apple, ou pas, où il, il s'est passé quelques années No, no, no. The phone did not show up. We did not even think about the phone until after we knew iPod was a success and a success not just in the U.S. but around. The iPhone was something when we started, when we started having really great success, Nokia and other cell phone companies that are more or less long gone now were trying to add MP3 player functionality to the phone and trying to capture some of the magic of the iPod because they wanted that market too because they saw this was competing for them. So they're like, oh, we're going to put music functions on there. And that's when we started seeing that this is an existential risk to iPod, saying, wait a second, what are we going to do? Because people only want to, want to carry one device with them. And which one's more important, a music player or a phone? And I think we can all agree that a phone is much more, or a communications device, is much more important for you if you're going to only have to take one device. And so that's where... You know, all the different other projects came around, Motorola Rocker and, and these things, trying to figure out what the future of the iPod and the future of music and communications is going to be at Apple. Il faut savoir aussi tuer le produit et savoir qu'il a une durée de vie limitée. C'est vachement important, j'imagine, de savoir se dire, de ne pas vivre sur ses acquis, voilà, chercher l'expression et, et préparer la transition. Euh, Tony, regardez cette photo. On vous voit à côté de, de Steve Jobs dans le laboratoire secret d'Apple à Cupertino. C'est un peu le, le saint des saints. Euh, peu de personnes y avaient accès à l'époque dans ce laboratoire. Euh, il y a une atmosphère no, that... particulière, hein, j'imagine. Yeah, that was that was the ID that was the ID lab where the various non work some working but mostly non working models would be where we would be working on the the um, the CMF the color material um, design function design inside that lab and so we would go there and we would all talk about the various models what they could do what they wouldn't do whether they would d did them or not but it was what the future could hold so it was a very special place where there's Macs and accessories and iPods and you know I can only imagine what it looks like now because it's got to be a very huge place or maybe multiple places since there's so many different products now. Et, et euh, au-delà de, de, du côté secret de, de la place, quel était le niveau d'implication Vous disiez tout à l'heure que, que Steve euh, Jobs surveillait l'équipe. Quel était son niveau d'implication Qu'est-ce qu'il euh, y avait de lui dans l'iPod concrètement So, you know, over time, so we would be meeting every kind of two weeks or so. Um, at the early part of the project, it was more like hands off. He was not quite involved. At the beginning, he was, and then near to the end. And then over time, it was every two weeks. When we were starting to start see sales and success, it was every two weeks we would have a major meeting and then I would bring a part of my team, then marketing would be there, sales would be there, business would be there. We'd have everybody and then we would present what's going on or other teams would present, but we would present the, the, the next generation of products and the roadmap and talk about what was coming next. But uh, at the end, you know, of the first, shipping the first iPod, We were in a room and for three, four hours, and we were drawing out the settings. 
and saying, should this set, what was the ordering of the settings? Should it say this? Where should this go? What about this feature? So we were literally together all around a whiteboard. It was probably four or five of us, Jeff Robin, myself, Stan or Jaws. Anyway, Steve, and we were all standing there and we were sitting there erasing and saying, oh no, it should go like this. And no, it should go like that. And we were literally designing the final UI details probably two weeks before we shipped, maybe three. Et il y avait, vous avez en mémoire une ou deux anecdotes concernant Steve où justement il a mis le point euh, sur quelque chose de vraiment important et qui était très juste, qui a fait que oh, yeah. l'iPod a été un succès. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if it was success or not, but there was this big argument about whether it should have a power button or a power switch or any or any kind of power whatsoever, any specific button. So that was a big one. And we went back and forth and back and forth because we were like, oh no, we need to have this and we have to lock down the design. Obviously, we didn't have one and it all worked out just fine. But it, there was definitely this uh, time, kind of like the, should the iPhone have a hardware keyboard or a, or a software keyboard? This, that was probably the one thing that was for about a month, three weeks, four weeks, because we didn't have much time, whether we we're going to have a power button or not. And so we had to prototype and put it all together. And obviously, we didn't. C'est un bel exemple. Il euh, y, y a souvent une, une, une histoire qu'on trouve sur, euh, beaucoup sur Internet, euh, de, de, dont l'auteur est, est Amit Chaudhary, qui est un ancien employé d'Apple, qui, qui raconte que lorsqu'il a eu le premier, peut-être pas le premier exemplaire final, mais l'un des prototypes en main, il n'était pas convaincu par la compacité euh, du produit, il le trouvait un peu gros, il voulait que vous le fassiez plus petit, et, et pour, pouvoir, euh, pour prouver qu'il était trop gros, il l'aurait jeté dans un aquarium, il y aurait eu des bulles qui seraient sorties, et donc forcément, regardez, il y a encore de la place, il y a des bulles. C'est un faux ou un tox This is not true at all. <laughs> okay. Pas vrai. On est là pour ça. Pas vrai. No, seriously, that was actually an old story from Sony. So that was the Sony Walkman story. Ah, so okay. c'est incroyable comme les choses yes, se transforment. Yes, yes, so, so, right. Well, because people think of the, the iPod of the most recent generation of the Walkman in a way, right? Because the Walkman showed portable music iPod re revolutionize it yet again. But it was all about a Walkman and saying there's still too much room in the Walkman and that's where they showed that. That never happened in the iPod. Frankly, we had so little time, there was a lot of air in that first iPod. <laughs> and we didn't know because we didn't know how much when it dropped, when the hard, remember you have to remember, this is a hard drive and people are pocketing it and they drop it just like your cell phone today, right? Your iPhone and you break your screen or whatever. We didn't know how a hard drive would perform. So we had extra air and extra bumpers and all this stuff to, because we were like, the, everybody will love it, but if it dies in three or four weeks because they drop it or just set it down wrong, that's a problem. Et c'est vrai qu'on euh, parlait tout à l'heure dans la conception de, de neuf mois qui est assez exceptionnelle. D'habitude, dans, dans l'industrie, euh, une période de test qui est extrêmement longue. Là, là ça a été vraiment à, à tambour. Enfin, euh, voilà, vous avez été très vite. Très, très, très court. Right. No, we had, we had to take our best guesses and hope for the best. Time to market. It was time to market. It was hoping for the best and using all our engineering skills, all of our analytical skills, all of our different skills to go, yes, we think we got it. And then we were dropping them and making weird fixtures and... Un dernier mot sur Steve. Euh, il y avait, euh, on lit dans sa biographie qu'il euh, y avait quelque chose qu'il n'aimait pas dans l'iPod, c'était son nom. Il y a eu beaucoup de débats. On, parle, euh, on a reçu dans, dans, ce, dans ce plateau euh, différents euh, dirigeants d'Apple de l'époque qui nous disaient qu'il n'aimait pas l'iPod. C'est vrai, le nom iPod Il y avait all kinds de noms, mais non, il n'y avait pas de contention around iPod. This was like, he was like, here's some names, this is the one I like. And we're like, no doubt. Yeah, well, you have to, with naming, you have to learn that you have to say it a lot and then it becomes natural. Anytime you hear a name for the first time, it's unnatural. But does it make sense? Does it, because I muse, something like that would only be music. What happens when we, like, it's like iTunes. When it added video, it was like iTunes for video? What? I don't get it. No, iPod was the right name and there was very, very little contention around that. Alors la simplicité c'est vraiment un ingrédient majeur de l'iPod, au-delà un ingrédient majeur, on le voit dans les photos qui défilent depuis le début de cette émission, c'est bien sûr le design, notamment le premier modèle blanc immaculé avec un dos magnifique en acier inoxydable. Alors on est vraiment loin là Tony des codes du marché de l'informatique, on est vraiment dans un autre univers. No, uh, that is true. This you know, if you look 
they were, you know, gray, beige, grayish, you know, black. Those are the kind of colors for consumer electronics and, and computers. But before the iPod, there was the iMac. And the iMac had all kinds of incarnations of the, as they say, lifesaver colors, the greens, the reds, the pinks, purples, blues, those kinds of things. And so they were looking at what's the next version of the design language. And they were already working on the next generation Macs, which were all white. And so that design process was already happening and they were taking from that design process of where the Macs were going and then applied that to the iPod. So it was very interesting that, you know, the Macs came out later that looked more like the iPod, white and what have you. But really those projects had already been started and we were drawing from that to put it on the iPod itself. Il y avait vraiment une volonté à l'époque de, 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 d'inscrire Apple dans un design industriel, une signature de marque. Hein. En fait, c'est ça l'idée. Oh yeah, that was, oh yeah, so it, not just at the time, but ever since the Steve coming back to Apple, it was all about what is, what are all the customer touch points? That includes all the advertisement, the packaging, everything, and making sure all of the design language and the messaging, everything was consistent along all the products, along every touch point. And that had just started just after the iMac was starting to have some success. Et cette signature, elle va aller même jusqu'au fameux casque blanc, hein, qui est vraiment une idée, moi je trouve géniale, qui était très différenciante de l'époque, hein, de la concurrence. Yeah. Ça a conduit à ces pubs extraordinaires qui ont fleuri, et les affiches qui étaient partout dans les métros, etc. Euh, et qui perdurent aujourd'hui encore avec l'iPhone. Yeah, it's still going. It's still going. Those white, those white headsets are, were, are and were iconic. Um, And uh, it, they were definitely, definitely bold for people to see. But that was the only one thing. Uh, it, it, it is great for a marketing thing when you have something that's in your pocket and you don't know what it is, but you can tell from the headphones. So it was, it all just came together. And that ad, you know, that ad celebrated the colors of the iPod plus the colors of the headphone because the headphones never became anything other than white. Um, that was three years later when we started bringing the, the PC connectivity and those kinds of things directly to it. And that's when it just <clears throat> all took off. Ouais, moi, j'ai pris je, un souvenir personnel, j'ai pris conscience du succès de l'iPod. Euh, j'avais la chance de, de venir vous voir, mais on n'avait pas le droit de vous parler à, à San Francisco chaque année pour le Macworld en mois de janvier, en début d'année. C'est une période intense pour vous, hein. c'était toujours à ce moment-là que, que, qu'Apple présentait des iPods. Et on avait l'habitude d'être dans le Moscone Center, de voir des, des centaines de, de Mac partout, des pommes partout, mais Apple était un petit peu le petit poussé de la tech. Et quand on sortait du Moscone, euh, la vie redevenait normale et on retrouvait les gens avec leur Dell, avec leur euh, ThinkPad. Et je me souviens, c'était allé, c'était en 2013-2014, je sors et je marche Market Street. Et là, je vois des centaines de gens avec tous des casques blancs dans les oreilles. Et vous aviez beaucoup d'avance sur le marché français. Là, je me dis, il est en train de se passer quelque chose. Revenons un mot sur le design euh, au sein d'Apple et pour conclure sur le, le, l'épisode du design. C'est, on dit souvent que c'est un domaine réservé, le design des, des designers, de Johnny Hive et de ses équipes à l'époque. Euh, comment ça se passait C'était un domaine réservé ou c'était euh, un échange constructif euh, où vous vouliez apporter des modifications, etc. etc. Well, I think there's a lot of internals and everything else, but to tell you the truth, you know, if you look at the very first styrofoam model, um, until, you know, till the time we locked down the design, they were very similar and we had almost no time to make any changes. So we had to lock down right around the middle of May, end of May, to be able to then go. So there was very little discussion about changes or what have you. We just had to hope that it was hope for the best. So there was one about, is the, was the back going to be aluminum or was it going to be stainless steel? Or There were certain kinds of things that we had to go through some trials on. But other than that, and then also the double shot top with the clear plus the white, making sure we can make those molds. But it was a very simple, very effective design. And the way we packaged it left a lot of room for changes, you know, along the route. So we, we didn't do a tight design like you know an iPhone by any means. This was... Throw it together as quickly as possible. Ouais, on peut vraiment dire que l'iPod, make it work, obviously. La, la, la conception de l'iPod était vraiment un cas d'école, on peut le dire, qui est aujourd'hui montré uh, dans toutes les écoles de commerce et de marketing. Uh, uh, et puis la gestation s'est bien passée, elle est arrivée à son terme. Uh, souvenez-vous, l'iPod a été présenté le 17 octobre 2020, 2001, pardon, et il va changer à, à jamais l'histoire d'Apple. On regarde la keynote de Steve. There it is, right there. 
Voilà, je vous assure. Ce petit appareil contient mille chansons. Euh, un, un souvenir particulier de, de cette keynote, de cette préparation, de cette présentation uh, I'll because we weren't done yet. Even at that launch, we weren't done, you know, with the manufacturing line and making sure we were all done. We weren't done with the software yet. We weren't, so we still had a few more days and things. And then even after that, we kept working. So that was just kind of a point in time. But yes, it was a, a magical day to, to actually see that a product that I had been thinking about for so many years actually come and it was Apple and Steve was there presenting it. and. And uh, it was just amazing after, for me, you know, I had been in Silicon Valley for 10 years, 11 years at the time. And uh, basically a fa you know, failure after failure after failure. Failed, my, we shipped products, they were good, but nobody bought them, these kinds of things, no funding or pr making products, the iPhone 20 years too soon or 15 years too soon. All of those things all culminated in that one day, which was, Amazing, you know, 10 years, 11 years later. Ouais, voir son produit, son bébé présenté par, par Steve Jobs, c'est un bel accomplissement, je veux bien le croire, Tony. Et puis l'iPod est sorti, il va rencontrer un, un immense pardon, succès, mais, mais pas de suite. Alors, on a connu euh, une décennie de folie iPod au début des années 2000, mais avant de devenir un hit euh, planétaire, euh, Tony, le succès du premier iPod n'a pas été euh, foudroyant, il faut bien le reconnaître. Euh, il a reçu vraiment un accueil très favorable de la presse, hein, des utilisateurs de Mac, des fans de musique. Hein. Bref, un succès qu'on appelle en France un succès critique, mais il n'est pas devenu un best-seller de suite. Pourquoi Well, yeah, it's true. It, uh, it wasn't a best-seller. It was a critical success. And... What I've learned over my, you know, my career now is it takes three generations to make something really take hold in the market and so it becomes a real business. And so for the iPod, the reason why it was a critical success and it was a sales success among the Mac set, but it was not among wider set because why? The iPod only worked with the Mac. So the first and second rent generations will only work with the Mac, and then there were people in the behind the scenes trying to hack it together to work on a Windows on a Windows computer. But it was they were somewhat successful, but it didn't work very well. So the first two two generations were all about Mac only connectivity, which you know required that you know the iPod, which was be three ninety nine or three forty nine or two two ninety nine depending on the year, the model, what have you was not the price of the Mac, or was not the price of the iPod. The price of the iPod was a new Mac, which is probably around $1,700, $1,800, plus the cost of an iPod, so for you to enjoy music. That was more than a home theater in many cases. So it was not a critical, it was a critical success, but not a commercial success, till after we were able to convince Steve to go off and build it compatible with the, the, the PC, the Windows. Windows edition. Yeah, no, he, he, he thought that the iPod was the way he was going to sell more Macs, but directly, not indirectly. And then what we had to do is we had to bet that indirectly we would, if people could try an Apple product on another platform, like it so much, it's a lower price point. Maybe they'll then buy up to a Macintosh later as opposed to both of them at the same time. And that took some time to get Steve comfortable with, and, and ultimately that's what made iPod have 80, 85% market share, depending on the, the quarter. Et, et les chiffres vous ont donné raison. Vraiment, le, la période charnière, c'est lorsqu'on a vu disparaître le Firewire qui était sur euh, la première version de l'iPod, qui était présent sur les PC, mais c'était très Mac hein, comme, euh, comme standard, qui a été remplacé par l'USB 2. Et au-delà, en 2002, on a vu l'arrivée du dock connector. Là, votre idée, Tony, c'était véritablement d'aller au-delà de, de, de le rendre compatible avec le, le PC grâce à l'USB, mais c'est de créer un vrai écosystème et l'incroyable écosystème qui est sorti derrière où, où si on n'avait pas un dock iPod dans un speaker ou dans un chaîne de stéréo, on ne pouvait plus la vendre. Hein. Yeah, absolutely. We wanted to make sure that there was a one quick way that you could charge, play music on a stéréo or, 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 or uh, sync 
sync your music onto it very quickly because we didn't have wireless then. Actually, most people don't rem remember that there was almost no Wi-Fi. There was almost no Wi-Fi at the time the iPod shipped. So we needed a way to get music in and off quickly, charge quickly, so we didn't have all these extra cables. So the docking connector was all about that, and it did more than that as well, as you, as you point out about, you know, there were chairs, there were chairs and sofas and tables and speakers and, and TVs and it's alarm clocks. Everything was crazy. building those 30 pin, yeah. it was insane, yeah. um, which was wonderful, yeah. you know, wonderful to see. Et puis la licence pour l'iPod, j'imagine, pour Apple, la licence, le trademark, you le need it, you need to have aussi. a license to use that connector, yeah. <laughs> ouais. Et puis vous disiez qu'il fallait convaincre Steve d'adopter le PC, adapter la version PC de, de l'iPod. Il a fallu adapter, bien sûr, iTunes sur Windows. On, on sous-estime aussi l'importance d'iTunes dans le succès de l'iPod euh, pour en faire un écosystème et un écosystème, il faut bien le reconnaître, fermé. Ab a absolutely. If there would be no iPod without iTunes. So Jeff Robin and his team were acquired by Apple um, and they, it was renamed iTunes and re recreated from Apple in iTunes. But Jeff brought it from his startup to Apple and made iTunes. But iPod could not have existed with iTunes or vice versa, frankly. It was a synergistic relationship and man, those guys are the best. You know, we worked together like when podcasts first came out, If everybody remembers podcasts, because you're all listening to them now. Yeah, on en fait un chaque semaine. From the avec time vous, podcasts were thought of to the time we implement them in the iPod as well as in iTunes was five to six weeks. And we shipped that feature. We didn't even know we were going to ship the feature. As soon as we said we're going to do it, we did it. We worked together incredibly hard and made iPod be the number one podcasting listening platform in the world with iTunes. So those are the kind of things that we could do when we're so tightly bound together. We all we were on a mission. So if it wasn't for iTunes, there would have been no iPod. Et, et au-delà, on peut, on peut vraiment dire que ce que craignait Apple, enfin, ce que voulait Steve, c'est dessiné à savoir que acheter un iPod allait conduire à acheter du Mac, à amener les switchers au Mac. Et c'est finalement le iTunes et l'iPod qui ont permis ça sur PC parce que c'était tellement plus simple sur un Mac que finalement, c'était un argument form formidable pour Apple à l'époque. Hein. Exactly. People would be like, oh, I love this Apple thing. Why can't I hook it up? And why is it so hard? And, and there were certain features that didn't go over to the PC that you could only get on the, on the Mac side. So there was all these different things. And over time, now you see everybody using Macs. You see all of these things happening. But it was a long journey, 20 years to get to this point. On dit en français, faire une faiblesse, une force. À partir de, de 2005, c'est vraiment le début de la, on en parlait tout à l'heure, de la folie iPod avec un record de vote en, en 2008. Hein. Euh, un, un an seulement après le lancement de l'iPhone, jugé plutôt avec 54,8 millions d'iPods vendus cette année-là. Après 2014, on n'a plus de chiffres puisqu'Apple a arrêté de, de communiquer euh, les nombres d'unités vendues d'iPod. On le regrette encore aujourd'hui dans ses résultats financiers. Mais l'iPod a été jusqu'à peser, Tony, jusqu'à 40% de chiffre d'affaires d'Apple. C'est phénoménal, c'est en 2006. Et on estime aujourd'hui environ quoi 400 000 In some quarters, it was actually over 50%. Donc, wow, c'est crazy. Et quoi, il s'est vendu presque plus de 400 millions d'iPod euh, à cette période-là. C'est le chiffre que vous avez à peu près en, en mémoire, c'est ça Yeah, a little bit more, yeah. <rire> un peu plus. Bon. Euh, L'iPod donc était vraiment partout, comme l'exemple que je vous donnais tout à l'heure. Alors moi, quand j'ai pris conscience modestement du succès de l'iPod dans les rues de San Francisco, euh, et puis les campagnes de publicité qui étaient également partout, ces silhouettes qui ont fleuré un peu partout. Euh, Est-ce qu'on peut dire qu'avec l'iPod, pour conclure sur ce sujet-là, c'était la première fois qu'un objet technologique devenait un objet de mode Possibly, you know, Walkman did the same thing. So the Walkman was a fashion object, you know, maybe a digital computing product. Yeah, I think that we were there. Um, you know, when I saw, you know, sports stars, not just music stars, because music stars, you know, they want music equipment, but when sports stars and other celebrities, movie stars, were all saying they had to have iPods, they were joking about it, showing it off to people, I was like, wow, something has really changed. I can't believe it, you know. Um, it was in movies. People were using it in movies, it became part of scripts. It was so cool to have an iPod. I was just, it was, and so you kind of pinch yourself, you go, okay, but you keep marching, because you have to remember that competition wants what you have. So, but it was really just uh, amazing to watch that global phenomenon happen. And there were no competitors. There were still no competitors, even for years. They never, in the history of the iPod, except for maybe the first two, three years, after that, there was no, nothing other product that you could buy. 
besides the iPod, truly, which was, I don't know another t lesson in time in history well, that, well, that will be like it was. Et vous auriez imaginé un tel succès lorsque vous travaillez avec votre petite équipe, vous partiez de votre petite euh, bloc-notes, euh, un tel succès mondial euh, autour de ce produit euh, euh, cher à votre cœur et à Steve Jobs Tell you the truth, after 10 years of all of that, all those failures and trying, I hoped it was going to be a success, so you always have to be optimistic. But I also learned to be very cautious and understand that politics and competition and market timing, all of these things all play a part in having a success, right? And that happened all again with the iPhone. You, ha you can't take anything for granted, nor can you assume anything. So you just have to work as hard as possible and hope for the best and do your absolute best work you possibly can and know when you're done with the work, you know it's not perfect, keep going. And so, it is, if, as you said, it, the first two generations weren't success, it wasn't the third generation. You need to have that stamina even when the down moments, even when people are saying it's the most amazing thing, when the numbers, the revenue isn't materializing, you have to keep working on it. You know, you can wave the flag, yeah, we won, but we didn't win. And we didn't win, frankly, until the iPhone won, because the iPod was going to be dead. It was going to be dead. It was a matter of whether we killed it or a competitor killed it. It was just a matter of time, unfortunately. Ouais. Et, et c'est vrai qu'il ne faut pas sous-estimer le succès de l'iPod parce qu'il a profondément, vous le souligniez tout à l'heure, mais encore un instant, transformé Apple, hein, qui n'était plus euh, un simple fabricant d'ordinateurs, mais était prêt pour euh, aller bien au-delà de, de, des unités centrales et des ordinateurs que j'ai devant moi. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because the iPod, it gave the company confidence. The confidence was back at Apple, like it was in the 80s, to go and do bigger, harder things. It gave confidence back to Steve that revenues were flowing, the investors were there, we could go get money, we had, we had suppliers, we had retail. We had no retail in 2001 when the iPod, none. You know, there were little Mac resellers and that was it and that was just a few in the US. No, so time, right? all of these things came together to say okay let's expand retail strategy, let's start going for other product categories, let's do more and more and more. So it was, you know, it was the thing that sparked a lot of other things. Alors, le succès de l'iPod va attiser bien sûr les convoitises et une redoutable c'est bien sûr le, le Zune. Qu'avez-vous pensé de la réponse de, de Microsoft Vous étiez inquiet à l'époque ah, je, kidding, je rigole, mais qu'est-ce que vous avez yeah. pensé du Zune quand vous l'avez vu arriver On a quelques images pour vous. Il y a d'ailleurs, vous l'aviez tourné en dérision dans une pub, Ghetto Mac. On a, on a quelques images pour vous. Uh, and look, I'm, I'm glad there's competition. If there's not competition, it doesn't keep us on our toes. So, you know, they came, they tried. Okay, good, good job. Uh, you know, Microsoft's in a very different position today than they were then as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have to give them credit for trying, um, but, you know, Not everything worked out, you know, remember, and not everything worked out at Apple either. There's a lot of failed projects along the way and failed, failed, uh, failed things. And, but you keep going and you'll find the right ones. And don't be afraid of failure. And that's where Microsoft is today as well. N'ayez pas peur de l'échec. Et vous l'avez dit, l'importance de, de prendre le, la décision de tuer le produit plutôt que, que ce soit vous qui l'appreniez plutôt qu'un concurrent. Et le champ du signe est arrivé avec l'iPod. Donc vous le disiez tout à l'heure, Tony, vous saviez que l'iPod était condamné, au-delà du fait qu'il était condamné par l'usage du smartphone hein, qui allait être un... qui intégrait un lecteur MP3. Est-ce que vous aviez perçu l'émergence du streaming également Oui, yeah, we, we absolutely did. So what we would do um, when it came to streaming, each year, we would map out all the storage. So we'd map out hard drives and flash and any kind of, we had optical storage. There's all kinds of different storage mediums that were coming with different things. And then we were like, wait a second, There's also, if you don't have storage on the device, there are data networks that are coming. And 2.5G was just starting. There was no 3G yet or anything. And we're like, one day, what we said was there is going to be this celestial jukebox, a jukebox in the sky that would hold all your music. And the day that happens, you don't have to worry about a lot of storage on your iPod. And that could be the day that the iPod is just... Uh, or another device could then just make access to it. And so we already had seen it, we had already projected it. It was just, you know, it's the march of technology. It may not be here today, but it could be here sooner or later, right? And you can kind of, you can kind of plot those uh, along a, a time axis and go, okay, around this time frame, we're going to be challenged. So we would have those internal uh, discussions all the time with the team. 
um, because we knew that this was all about enjoying music. And if we, iP if we were able to iPod the Walkman, who's going to iPod the iPod, so to speak? De euh, manière générale, dans la tech, euh, aucune place n'est acquise. On pourrait résumer ça comme ça. Regardez une question pour vous d'un tweetos de, de, du compte Aurelem.tv, alias Aurelem qui s'appelle Officier Ludique. Pensez-vous euh, que l'iPod va continuer à être mis à jour et que cet appareil a définitivement fait son temps et a été complètement absorbé par l'iPhone Et sinon, des petites anecdotes sur la conception de l'iPhone, on en a eu déjà eu plein ce soir. Est-ce que vous pensez que l'iPod, bah, il existe encore Il y a encore l'iPod Touch aujourd'hui dans le catalogue d'Apple, mais est-ce que vous pensez qu'il a encore un avenir Oh, I think, you know, the iPod Touch is a, is a, you know, the iPod Touch was all about kind of a, just a media and entertainment machine, not necessarily communications. That's when it was envisioned. It still continues today for various other applications. But to think of the iPod Touch as a real iPod from back then, it's really not. Same thing with an iPod, you know, there's, or an iPhone. It's not simply an iPod anymore. It's a much more than that. And usually the music is in the background while you're doing something else. Whereas in the iPod, it was first and foremost primarily a music device with, you know, photos or video, but really a music device. And to have a device like that in the future, I think we're going to want more and more devices in certain settings that are very much application specific and don't have notifications and WhatsApp or other kinds of things on there. I still think there is a point for those. There are still MP3 players being produced as Sony makes those, those kinds of things. I still believe that kind of player in certain applications or settings makes a lot of sense when you don't need to have an Is iPhone or anything else. Ouais. Euh, notre Twitter nous demande quelques anecdotes. J'ai lu une anecdote, je ne sais pas si elle est vraie, euh, vous allez me, euh, me, me retoquer si ce n'est pas le cas. Euh, on, on parle en 2005 d'un iPod top secret, ça vous parle C'est David Scheyer, yeah. c'est Tibis yeah, qui a yeah, publié yeah, cette yeah, info. Yeah. Il parle du projet P68. Deux ingénieurs sure. au département de l'énergie des États-Unis ont demandé à, à Apple de concevoir un iPod spécial. Qu'est-ce que c'était que cet iPod spécial euh, Tony, ça vous rappelle quelque chose <rire> Oh, I, I know exactly the project, and I can't speak much detail about it. Um, <laughs> Il y a déjà quelques stormtroopers qui ont débarqué. It was... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, seriously. Uh, no, there was a top secret iPod project that we were working in, well, the government was working on and was asking for special access to certain things. As far as I know, it was all a matter of national security. You also have to remember in those 10 months or 9 months of the iPod being designed and produced, For the first one, 9-11, you know, the Twin Towers came down. So 9-11 had happened. And so that was a whole nother drama for the team. But, um, but no, uh, and everybody was using iPods, and they were ubiquitous, right, in airports, everywhere else. They were hoping to turn those iPods into certain types of devices to help with, you know, terrorism and surveillance. That's about all I can say. They went off and did what they wanted okay. to go do with them. And we, we, and we were helping them behind the scenes. Voilà, in capteur. a very secretive way with a very couple of few people from the team. Yeah. Avec un petit uh, capteur secret qui permettait de capter certaines choses. Voilà, bon, on n'en dira pas plus. Euh, <laughs> euh, alors, on a une autre anecdote. Elle est franco-française. Celle-ci, elle est propre à l'iPod okay. à Paris. Et c'est notre chroniqueur. Il s'appelle Monsieur X. Oh. Pourquoi Monsieur X Puisque c'est l'ancien responsable d'Apple qui... Qui, euh, qui témoigne dans cette émission depuis des années visage masqué euh, et euh, il nous raconte l'histoire d'un iPod prototype qui a disparu en France. Monsieur X. Bonjour Tony. Pensez-vous que le succès de l'iPod doive beaucoup à l'implication des équipes qui ont travaillé dessus Une anecdote pour illustrer euh, mon propos. En septembre 2002, l'iPod 2 est interdit de vente en France car son niveau sonore est trop puissant. Un ingénieur de Cupertino est alors envoyé en France avec un iPod 2 modifié qui règle ce problème afin de passer une nouvelle certification. Mais cet ingénieur a eu malheureusement un accident avec son taxi en sortant de l'aéroport Charles de Gaulle et a refusé de se faire soigner. Il est venu jusqu'au siège d'Apple France où nous avons dû mettre d'abord cet iPod 2 dans un coffre avant qu'il n'accepte d'aller voir un médecin. Est-ce que c'est cette dévotion qui fait la différence en termes d'innovation avec Apple 
Tony, avant de répondre à, à, à monsieur, j'allais dire son vrai nom, il ne faut pas, euh, il, il, il est modeste, il pourrait donner plus de détails. Il faut, il faut se souvenir que cette personne, parce qu'on me l'a raconté, cette histoire, euh, euh, a pris l'avion, il avait, vous savez, comme c'est... Ces vestes de reporter d'image où vous avez euh, la place pour mettre les objectifs, pour mettre les, euh, les, les, euh, les pellicules à l'époque. Et il avait caché ses iPods et il les gardait sur lui précieusement durant tout le voyage. Et il faisait très attention que. Voilà, euh, c'était. Et, et lorsqu'il a eu son accident, il a refusé de se faire soigner. Il a refusé qu'on lui enlève la veste. Et il, a, il était en, en sang. Hein. Il, a, il est arrivé à, 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 aux Uli en sang. C'est quand même une histoire de dingue de l'implication de, de vos équipes à l'époque sur, sur l'iPod. The, the teams, the only reason why these products happen and these, these, these amazing creations happen is because of the dedication of the teams and the people behind them who really want these, these, these new technologies, these new ways of being, these superpowers to come to life. And they guard them like they're, they're babies. Like literally they're their own babies. Guys can't have babies. Uh, we can, our, our, our partners can have them, but we can't have them. So... This is the next best thing. And so we guard them with our lives, right? And I have many stories, not just like that, but other ones um, that are the same kind of thing where people would put their, put their life on the line for the thing they're creating and the team behind them to make sure it stays safe, to make sure it, you know, it um, stays secret, depending on the time. So yeah, no, without a doubt, without that dedication, without that um, uh, passion, We could not build what we built for the first generation iPod all the way through all the iPhones and all the other stuff that we were, we were made together. Now, that said, the reason why we were here in France was a whole nother reason, which was all about the volume level. And so this was a big thing inside of the company <laughs> about how can France not allow the iPod to be shipped in France because the volume level is too loud. We're like, that's what you're supposed to do with music players and have that. You love loud music because the, the, because the government was worried that we were going to hurt people's eardrums. So that was a very funny story and we have lots of vous anecdotes and, à... and jokes about that one. C'est là yeah. que vous avez commencé à découvrir euh, ce qu'on appelle en France le principe de précaution qui est très français euh, maintenant que vous vivez ici à Paris. Euh, revenons, donc, euh, faisons table rase du passé, revenons à Apple aujourd'hui. Quel regard euh, portez-vous aujourd'hui sur Apple et, et la musique euh, C'est devenu une tradition chez Apple de sortir des produits musicaux. Quel regard vous, 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 portez, vous, vous, vous portez sur Apple On sait qu'Apple a racheté Beats notamment, euh, qui a permis les sure. d'Apple Music. Est-ce que euh, vous trouvez que ça a été une bonne idée, que c'est une bonne chose, euh, le chemin qui a été tracé depuis Je pense qu'Apple a beaucoup de leeway et beaucoup de you know, flexibility to try many, many different things. And so it's, it's great they're trying many things. Some things work and some things don't work. And so they need to just keep trying and innovating and, and they are succeeding in certain things and other things they're learning. And so, um, you know, the path they're on is the path uh, that was set for them, you know, um, in some ways with the iPhone, but other ways, new things that the team has created, whether that's, uh, you know, whether it's something like HomePod or something like that. So I think that they, you know, are on the trajectory that they want to go on. Things are going well. Uh, I don't think you can, like, shoot a lot of holes and you could say, that's not right and that's not right. But at the end of the day, it is the most valuable company in the world compared to where it was 20 years ago. It's, P, it's beloved by everyone. Um, it's influential around the world and has become, you know, critical to certain governments and things, worrying about how the companies work with them and stuff. So... You know, it's a very different place than when I was there and we had like 3,500 to 4,000 people there, right, when I first started. Now it's almost 200,000, I, I think it's something like that. And so it's a very, very different place. Even the buildings are different. So, uh, you know, they're going to make their decisions the way they do. Apple connaît donc un, un grand succès aujourd'hui dans la musique. On pense notamment au succès euh, important des Airpods, hein, qui, qui rappelle celui de l'iPod en 100 ans. Il tente aujourd'hui une percée sur le marché des enceintes avec le HomePod. C'est un marché que vous connaissez bien, celui des enceintes, puisque de, euh, de votre temps, vous aviez lancé de l'iPod iFi. E Pourquoi ne pas, ne pas avoir persévéré à l'époque sur les enceintes déjà so So the iPod Hi-Fi was a long project. There was a lot of learning there. We had to learn how to make high quality audio. We had to learn how to... Um, create the tooling for that product, which was very, very expensive, the plastic shells and everything. There was a lot of new things that went on in that product. And um, in some ways, I think we overshot the mark. We over-designed. It was very costly. Uh, the market wasn't quite ready for it. 
it wasn't quite sure. And so when we got there, and it was a good product, but it was a little late, it wasn't exactly the right feature set any longer that needed to be there. It was very expensive, we didn't make great margins on it, as we normally did with accessories, and the market wasn't quite starting. There was another problem. So that was the product. The another problem was is we had very few resources to put on design for those kinds of products, engineering, all those things. And we were like, well, what else would we be doing with those same resources instead of spreading them thin and only doing a 80% a, a, a job instead of the 100% Apple job and not getting the right business parameters running? So at that point, we decided to exit it and focus on things that we could do much better with much better business return and leave that aside. And that was the precursor to what we see today, which is very, very expensive, you know, um, high quality in-home speakers in all kinds of ranges. But that was the first of what started the market. We just decided to pull out of that um, for, for lack of resources and focus. Alors, pour conclure ou presque sur Apple et le sujet d'Apple aujourd'hui, une question d'un euh, tweetos sur Twitter de François SLN. Alors, regardez, euh, Tony, pour, bonjour Tony Fadel. Pensez-vous qu'Apple, c'est une question récurrente de beaucoup d'utilisateurs de, euh, de la marque, innove encore aujourd'hui Oui, ils sont en train d'innover. Ils sont en train d'innover à tous les niveaux. Les gens continuent à penser que c'est tout à juste un nouveau hardware product or something like that. There's many new software products, there's many new services products. Now there's Apple TV Plus. They're innovating in many different ways. It may not be the traditionalist Apple, you know, fanboy, but they're innovating in many, many different ways in the recycling recycling of, of the, their products, how you can turn trade them in, these kinds of things. So there's still a lot of innovation. It's just not necessarily the same innovation that you're used to from year 2000. Look at all the software innovations in iOS 15 and, and on the desktop as well. Look at M1. I think the biggest thing you have to look at, and this is a project we started when I was there, which was bringing ARM in-house, yeah, when we, did, when we brought ARM in-house um, and we bought PA Semi, which I was a part of, my wife was too, we brought in PA Semi because there was a, there was a, a split. A Steve wanted to go to Intel-based iPhones and iPads back in 2007, eight, it's eight time frame. And I was dead against it. I was absolutely against that. I said, no way are we going to Intel for these products. I am not going to make products with Intel. They are behind the times. There is no way. So there was a huge rift. And ultimately, Steve and I, you know, you can read about it in, 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 in Walter Isaacson's book and all this. Anyways, we had a big rift, but we came back together. Intel was kicked out. We bought PA Semi to create our own ARM processors. And the M1 was all about that trajectory from that point to getting now the best hardware with the best software and no longer being beholden to chip companies that don't see things the same way we did at the time. And so M1 is a huge innovation and the amount of new things that can be built with that across the products is going to be insane. You just don't see it today, but it is a major, major innovation that is going to take five to 10 years to really come to full fruition in, across the Apple platform. So absolutely, they're innovating. La boucle est, est bouclée avec la puce M1. C'est intéressant ce que vous dites notamment sur, sur voilà, la, la genèse de cette puce qui, euh, qui aujourd'hui, Apple en récolte les fruits euh, de, de, de cette ère où vous étiez chez Apple avec notamment Steve Jobs. Parmi les, les pistes des futurs produits dont on parle beaucoup d'Apple, on parle beaucoup donc de lunettes, de réalité augmentée. On a une question à ce sujet de notre chroniqueur à nouveau, de Damien Douani. Vous avez été appelé à la rescousse par Google pour faire un reboot de son projet Glaces. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on voit beaucoup de marques, Facebook, Microsoft, Snapchat, qui sortent leurs propres lunettes de réalité augmentée ou de réalité virtuelle. D'après vous, qu'est-ce que Apple doit faire avec ces lunettes qu'ils vont sortir, on espère, euh, pour que ce soit un hit mondial, pour se différencier et pour faire finalement de ces lunettes un nouvel iPod <rire> Easy question. Well, yeah, easy question. Well, let's be clear. We, you know, we were doing glasses actually in 2005-06. So we were doing VR kind of glasses for watching movies so that you could watch a full screen movie back then. So we started doing the research there. And interestingly enough, you know, the same problems and challenges we had then are still the same problems and challenges now. So Apple is a consumer company, not a, a, a corporate company where like a Microsoft or something like is. So when you're a consumer, 
it's all about the emotional experience. And AR glasses have to have an amazing emotional experience. And that emotion really comes from the display, okay? HoloLens has a great display for corporates and industrials and all the other stuff. But I don't believe it's enough for consumers. And it's very expensive, all kinds of other things. Apple has to have incredible display technology. If it doesn't, it shouldn't be shipping a product unless it has world, world-class display technology. Otherwise, it's going to be another one of those end up on the heap kind of uh, VR and AR, XR uh, kind of thing. So I think that really they need to, they, if, and they probably do, have some kind of great display technology to make this happen. The other one is, is it going to be an accessory to phone or is it going to actually be a standalone? I think the easiest thing to do is an accessory, but then like the Apple Watch, mostly it's an accessory. So you still need the phone. So I think again, the watch over time, will become its own thing. AR glasses, if they have the right display technology, then that can also happen and they will become its own standalone thing with the right software and services in the cloud. But, you know, it remains to be seen. I don't have any inside track other than I know the display technologies and I know what's possible. Um, hopefully they've been able to, to, to not, to, you know, to, to hit that one. On pourrait well. voir le même scénario qui est, euh, qui est arrivé pour l'iPod où l'iPod a été tué par l'iPhone et qu'à terme peut-être la montre ou euh, les lunettes, on verra, euh, pourrait tuer à, à son tour le smartphone. On parle du futur cette fois-ci, mais de votre, vous y croyez pas, euh, de votre futur, euh, Tony. Euh, une question, <rire> une dernière question de nos chroniqueurs, il s'agit de Laurent Pontanach. Bonjour Tony, quand on sait que vous êtes l'homme de l'iPod, de l'iPhone, du Thermotanest, euh, si je prends juste ces trois produits, ce sont trois produits qui, qui ont changé la façon d'utiliser la technologie à tout jamais. J'ai envie de vous dire, s'il vous plaît, ne vous arrêtez pas en si bon chemin. Euh, du coup, ma question est très très simple. Quels sont les trois prochains produits que vous allez sortir ou sur lesquels vous êtes en train de travailler et qui vont à nouveau changer le monde Vous êtes jeune, hein, Tony, il y a encore de la marge hein, pour sortir trois produits qui vont changer le monde. I'm not as young as I used to be. I used to have hair at the time of the iPod. Uh, je suis chauve. Um, so, <laughs> so, no, right now I, I am designing new products. I am designing some really cool new things. I can't talk about them, of course. But they'll be coming out over the next kind of year to two years. Um, some of them are unconventional things for me, and others are very conventional in terms of what I've done in the past. So those things are coming, but even more importantly, I work with, you know, I have a firm called Future Shape, and we've invested in over 200 companies around the world um, who are making incredible products today, um, or are going to be making products that have incredible benefits for society, environment, for health. These kinds of things are so important to us that we have to then take the technology like the iPhone that we created and now how do we apply that to help us fight climate change, fight cancer, you know, bring our societies together and not tear them apart. These are the kinds of things that I'm focused on with our team and many people from the, from, from the Apple days as well, helping to help these companies, many of them, even, even here in France, find what those next great revolutionary products and services are. Ouais, donc là, vous êtes aujourd'hui un, un entrepreneur, un investisseur, hein, via votre fonds, vous en avez parlé à l'instant. Puis vous aimez les produits, on le sait bien, vous allez revenir pour concevoir un futur. <rire> vous avez fait le Nest, vous avez fait l'iPod. On, on a hâte de voir le, le prochain produit, Tony. Thank you very much, Olivier. En tout cas, Tony, merci beaucoup d'avoir participé à cette émission. On a pris énormément de plaisir à vous écouter euh, religieusement. Euh, on a appris plein de choses encore euh, grâce à vous. Merci pour votre confiance. C'est la fin de cet épisode d'En fait le Mac. Merci de l'avoir suivi. On se retrouve très vite, Tony. Euh, vous venez quand vous voulez. On est voisins. Hein. Donc, Paris ouais, euh, est un village. Euh, merci. Donc, venez, vous êtes ouais, ici. Exact, exactement. Le, le bienvenu. On aura d'autres anniversaires à fêter. De nombreux anniversaires, j'espère. Bon anniversaire, l'iPod. <rire> et encore, bravo à toute la team d'En refait le Mac et d'Electronics Productions pour la de ce studio et vous derrière vos écrans merci pour votre fidélité derrière euh, vos écrans je l'ai dit vous, je vous donne rendez-vous dès la semaine prochaine pour un nouvel épisode et pour être prévenu en temps réel de la mise en ligne de l'émission je vous invite à vous abonner bien sûr à notre chaîne en cliquant sur le petit bouton et n'oubliez pas de cliquer également sur le petit pouce merci encore pour votre fidélité et à la semaine prochaine au revoir merci merci, merci, merci. good, good. Very good. <laughs> Amazing.